Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today it is time to have a look at the suggestions past the developers for February of 2020. Obviously I've been a bit busy with stuff like the dev server and other uh, update 1.97 stuff, so sorry this is a bit late, but better late than never. Let's get into the aviation portion and uh, we're going to split this as we normally do, so one video for aviation, one video for ground forces, so on and so forth. There's a little bit for everyone here, which is really nice. I'm very, very happy with the way that coke spray and his team have been working through this i think it's much better to emphasize all parts of the game instead of just a few of them so that's you know really nice to see and we start off with a banger this is the northrop xp56 black bullet and if you don't know what this is well it is uh, definitely an interesting vehicle let's try and get a nice picture so i can show you on the screen maybe this one is probably the best one to go for so let's talk about uh, the northrop xp XP-56. The initial idea uh, for the XP-56, uh, it uh, came around in 1939, and it was kind of a crazy idea if you compare it to many that were around at the time. It was supposed to have no horizontal tail, only a small vertical tail, and it would use an experimental engine and also be produced only using um, metal. The aircraft was to be a wing with a small central fuselage added to, the, uh, added to house the engine and the pilot, and the hope was that this configuration would have less aerodynamic drag than a conventional airplane. I'd also just like to thank uh, Ta Kanata uh, for putting this article together as well. As always, uh, it's very kind of everybody to uh, build these articles. Uh, it's you know a, a credit to them and the community that they're able to do this. So the idea uh, for for this single-seat aircraft originated in 1939, as said, as the Northrop N2B model. It was designed around an engine. Uh, this engine was the Pratt & Whitney liquid called X1800. It was in a pusher configuration, uh, so the engine, you know, being at the back, uh, so like a few other uh, machines that we have in the game, such as the Ascender, and it was going to drive contra-rotating propellers. The U.S. Army actually ordered Northrop uh, to begin in design work on a on this design on the 22nd of June 1940 and after reviewing the design they ordered a prototype aircraft on the 26th of September 1940 so they saw something in it and shortly after the design work begun, Pratt & Whitney uh, stopped development for the X-1800 engine. So, yeah, it was a bit of an issue, right, where the, um, the engine that you're building your machine around ceased to exist. So, the Pratt and Whitney 2800 or the R2800 engine was substituted instead, uh, but it was considered not entirely suitable. The reason for this uh, was even though it was more powerful, it had 2000 horsepower compared to 1800, it was bigger. It had a larger diameter, it required a larger fuselage to house it, and because of this, this actually delayed the program by five months, so quite a decent amount of time, especially when you talk about wartime. It was expected that the new engine would require a 2,000 pound weight increase and cost 14 miles per hour in top speed. So even though the engine itself, you know, is a more powerful engine, the machine would suffer from it. The tailless design uh, that was novel at the time and also considered high risk, it was also decided to construct a small, lightweight plane of similar configuration for testing called the Model N1M. And this is normal, you know, you see this a lot. We talked about the uh, flying pancake, you know, about a week ago, and that was kind of the same idea. And in parallel with the design of the XP-56, which had successful flight trials of the configuration, uh, which were conducted utilizing the airframe, they confirmed uh, the basic layout that they wanted to go with. There were two small uh, Lycoming engines uh, powered uh, that aircraft, and these trials confirmed the stability of the radical design, and also upon review, the Army decided to construct a second prototype, which was ordered on the 13th of February 1942. 
Northrop uh, constructed the XP-56 uh, out of magnesium alloy for the airframe and the skin, and this was because aluminium was forecast to be in short supply during the uh, wartime demands. So at the time, there was little experience with magnesium aircraft construction, and because magnesium cannot be easily welded using conventional techniques, Northrop hired Vladimir Pavleka uh, to develop the Helarc welding uh, technique for magnesium alloy, which is pretty cool. Uh, so the first prototype, let's talk about it. The, so the first engine uh, runs in the aircraft were conducted in late March 1943. So around about, you know, four years, three years after the initial idea. The problem, it had a few problems. Uh, excessive propeller shaft flex uh, caused the engine to fail. Pratt and Whitney did not send another engine until August, which caused the five month delay. And taxi tests of the XP-56 began in the 6th of April 1943 and showed a serious yaw problem with the aircraft. And at first, it was thought to be caused by uneven wheel brakes, and considerable effort was placed into fixing this problem, but the manual hydraulic brakes were installed, and the aircraft flew on the 30th of September 1943 at Murloc Base in Southern California. Eventually, that problem was solved, uh, the yaw problem, and it was traced to a lack of aerodynamic stability, and to fix this, the upper vertical stabilizer was enlarged, uh, with from a mere stub uh, to one virtually matching the ventral unit in shape and area so they just made it a little bit you know they just made it a little bit larger that uh, you can see uh, in this uh, picture down here so the after a number of flights the first xp-56 was actually destroyed on the 8th of october 1943 when the tire on the left gear blew out during a high-speed taxi uh, across murloc dry lake they were going around 130 miles per hour and the pilot john myers survived with minor injuries which he credited to the innovative wearing of a polo player's helmet <laughs> myers was the test pilot for several of northrop's uh, radical designs during the war uh, so that's uh, kind of <laughs> kind of interesting and then of course they built a second prototype so a number of changes were made to it of course they included a re-ballisting uh, to move the center of gravity forward they also increased the size of the upper vertical tail and reworked the rudder control linkages the second prototype it wasn't completed until january 1944 so five years after initial thoughts and the aircraft flew on the 23rd of march 1944 the pilots uh, had difficulty lifting the nose wheel below 160 miles per hour. Uh, he also reported extreme yaw sensitivity, and uh, this flight test lasted uh, eight minutes. Uh, but subsequent flight tests went longer, and the nose heaviness disappeared when the landing gear was retracted. The only relatively low speeds were attained for the vehicle, and while urging uh, the NACA, which would eventually turn into NASA, uh, to investigate the inability to attain design speeds, further flight tests were made and on the 10th flight the pilot noted extreme tail heaviness lacking uh, lacking of power and also excessive fuel consumption and the flight testing was then ceased as too hazardous and the project was abandoned after a year of inactivity and then by 1946 the u.s army air forces was developing jet-powered fighters and had no need for a new propeller driven fighter aircraft so you can see that this machine had a lot of issues uh, when it came to its general use it is a pretty cool uh, vehicle though and even though it wouldn't be too fast it would have a pretty fun armament either 220 millimeters and four uh, with 450 caliber machine guns it's just uh, flying it's maybe the general issue the next vehicle to have a look at is a simple one and it's from milo cat and it's talking about of course the arado the arado had many different specifications and variants uh, depending on which ones you wanted to look at and today milo is talking about the Arado 234B2N. This was an attempt to take the B2 strike bomber and make it into a night fighter. So obviously in the last uh, few years of World War II, Germany needed dedicated night fighters. This is why a lot of their vehicles, uh, they had night fighter variants to them to try and make them a little bit more useful, uh, try to stop the night raids from British bombers and also other nations' bombers. Uh, and they decided that the Arado 234 would be a suitable platform to try this. So what they did is they removed all of the bombing equipment, which makes sense, and they put the FUG, 
Neptune radar system in the front of it, and also an under-fuselage gun pod. Uh, this gun pod contained two 20mm MG151 cannons with 200 rounds each, and there were plans to convert around about 30 of the bombers into these night fighters, but there was only two which were ever completed. Uh, they did see service, though, in the last days of World War II, and supposedly they shot down a few RAF bombers. So, yeah, it's a, it's a simple design, you know, take out all of the stuff that the Arado is known for and replace it uh, with some, you know, areas to make it a little bit more, uh, a little bit more Night Fighter-esque. It would be kind of fun to see this as some kind of attacker in the game, but I, I always worry about <laughs> when it comes to these certain vehicles, especially if they keep their air spawn. The next vehicle is a big chungi. Uh, this is from Imperial Admiral, and it is the Beriev BE-10, the Mallow. And this one's actually got a really cool story behind this. Uh, so let's just actually find a better picture. This is probably a better picture, isn't it? So the uh, Beriev BE-10, the Mallow, uh, it was one of these uh, vehicles that uh, came around post-war. So at the end of the 1950s, the Black Sea Fleet Air Arm, they introduced the Beriev BE-10. It was a twin turbojet flying boat. It was designed as a maritime reconnaissance slash strike aircraft, and in the summer of 1959, the 977th OMD RAP, or Independent Naval Long Range Reconnaissance Air Regiment, as it's known, uh, based at uh, Lake Donuslav on the Crimean Peninsula, started converting from BE-6s to BE-10s. Uh, there were two squadron regiments uh, that uh, used the BE-10s, and uh, they were chosen because of its close proximity to the manufacturer, allowing problems to be resolved quickly, which made sense. And then in 1961, uh, the actual squadron which operated them got renamed to the OPLAP, or the Independent ASW Air Regiment, and in the summer of the same year, the BE-10 made its public debut when four aircraft piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Andreevsky, Major uh, Borisenko, Major Gordaev, and Captain Ponomarenko made a formation fly pass during the uh, Navy Day festivities in Leningrad. And then shortly after that, uh, several BE-10s were redeployed uh, to the freshwater lake, the Pledgeyevo, in uh, order to participate in the 1961 Aviation Day fly pass in Moscow, uh, Toshino. What's kind of interesting uh, on this vehicle is even though it was a vehicle which was used for many years uh, into the 60s, uh, what you actually find from it is uh, a really interesting fact. So the interesting fact is that this was actually never included in the Soviet Navy's inventory even though it was in active service. So it's kind of one of those machines that is just kind of forgotten about uh, in history, when it definitely shouldn't be, because of the fact that it was used for such a long time. And if you want to know its general characteristics, uh, so... Obviously, it had the turbojet engines, and it had access to four 23mm guns, two in the forward firing position, and two in a radar-controlled tail turret, so very similar to something like the IL-28. It could carry up to three RAT-52 torpedoes, or 12 250-kilo bombs, or one big old 3,000-kilo bomb. And, of course, you have the uh, anti-shipping mines for it as well. The general speed of this machine is 910 kilometers an hour. So this is not a slow machine, this is not a lumbering machine, it is a big chungi with big old engines. The next vehicle we're going to have a look at is once again from Milo Cat, but this time it's Japanese. And it's talking about a pretty cool little vehicle, uh, I'm not sure how it would fit in the game, apart from in a naval setting, which I'm happy for. I would like to see more naval aircraft so they could capture points, so they could, you know, maybe do some recon, maybe throw in some mechanics for them. I think for me, that would be really interesting. Interesting. So, the plane we're talking about today is the AHE E 16A, and this was a Japanese reconnaissance and light bomber float plane designed to replace the earlier Aichi uh, E 13A. The, uh, the 
uh, compared to the E13A, the E16A uh, reduced the number of crew to th uh, from three to two. It fitted a more powerful engine, and it also uh, had uh, access to some pretty cool armament. So this this machine, even though it was a reconnaissance machine, could carry up to a 250 kilos worth of bombs, and its armament was two 20 millimeters fixed in the wings for the pilot and a 13 millimeter machine gun for the rear gunner. So this isn't one of those machines machines which doesn't have a ton of armament. 220mm is easily enough uh, to be able to give somebody a rat-a-tat. The, uh, and also uh, the other thing is it was also, it, one of the odd things about it is even though it was a float plane, it was also equipped with dive brakes and this meant that it could function as a dive bomber even though it was a recon plane, <laughs> so it's just very, very, very odd. It was also designed, obviously, for long patrols. It was designed to, you know, just uh, mainly do recon stuff, but with the extra extra armament that we see on it, including the bombs and the guns, it makes a little bit more sense to add it to War Thunder uh, because of that fact. Uh, there are some other stuff uh, which is pretty cool about it as well. It entered frontline service in early 1944, so this was technically a late war act, Aircraft, and it saw extensive uh, use against the Allied forces in the Philippine uh, campaign and unfortunately has suffered horrific losses along with other types of Japanese aircraft which were used in the conflict. Many of the surviving aircraft were expended in kamikaze attacks and uh, this was mainly against Allied ships around Okinawa. The E-16A, it would be a lovely plane to see and uh, just the fact that, you know, it has a little bit of everything with its Type 9 20 millimeters and a bit of bomb i think personally it would be a lovely addition to the game the next vehicle we're having a look at is the aidc at3 and is brought to us by mickey hoshi this uh, vehicle is a pretty fun one as well uh, it's a uh, vehicle which hopefully we could see in the chinese tech tree at some point so let's go through its uh, interesting history so the at3 uh, started its life in the mid 70s as the ROCAF, um, which is the Republic of China Air Force, requested that its outdated T-33As would be to replaced with an advanced trainer. Uh, they also wanted something which would fit some attacker roles. So the AIDC, which was the only manufacturer of, of aircraft in Taiwan, partnered up with Northrop and uh, they made the preliminary design of the X-83. And uh, the problem was, though, as we see a lot of the times in history, Northrop uh, was actually asked to withdraw assistance uh, the following year by the U.S. government. And the reason for this is because the U.S. government wanted to maintain a health relationship with the People's Republic of China or uh, the Proc Boys and as I've said many times you know it's uh, it's kind of interesting when a lot of people talk about Taiwanese independence when uh, the American government doesn't even support it uh, especially when it comes to their dealings and everything like that and yes people always bring up money and things like that but it's just it, if you look through the history of the thing it's very very complicated anyway the AIDC uh, continued on with the development of the X-83 without Northrop's help, and they assembled their first prototype on the 17th of July 1980. It was named the Zhu Chung, or Self-Reliant in English, and the X-83's first flights would occur two months later. And on the 16th of September, with both Colonel Fang Huang and uh, test pilot Li Ching Kiang, I think is how you say that, at the controls, the ROCA was impressed with the aircraft and placed an order for 60 aircraft designated the AT-3 with the first delivery arriving in 1984. The AT-3 it was equipped with a HUD, obviously a Doppler radar system, radar warning receiver, FLIR equipment and it's powered by two Garrett TFE 7312 turbofan engines which each produce around 3,500 pounds worth of thrust. The, uh, this coupled with a dual independent crossfeed fuel system uh, for redundancy, and the armament also consists of five pylon stores. It has one in the center line and then four wing pylons, uh, which, you know, would be uh, really nice to see. And it also would be one of those actual native, you know, vehicles uh, that uh, you can find for at least the Taiwanese. The center, pi the center pylon can 
can optionally be removed uh, for the ability to carry a ventral gun pack containing two M3 12.7mm machine guns, and each wingtip has the ability to mount an infrared guided air to air missile in defense, something that you see with a lot of uh, jets from um, the more modern era. And while primarily regulated to the trainer role, the AT3 replaced the outdated T 33A with the 35th Night Attack Squadron, where the aircraft was painted in the recognizable USAF style SEA camo, and a proposed variant to keep the AT3 modernized is the AT3 Max, and the AT3 Max proposal includes a lengthening of the nose, as well as modern avionics and fire control systems. Uh, this machine is still used today, by the way, which is why they're talking about modernization efforts. So, its armaments are kind of crazy. You know, you've got the ventral gun pack, which we talked about, uh, then, of course, uh, two, a bunch of different bombs, including cluster bombs. Uh, then you have a look at its air to airs. It can use AIM 9Ps, Ls, or Ms, and then the Tian Chen uh, infrared air to air missiles. So you're not getting away from this thing. It's uh, pretty, pretty beastly, <laughs> and uh, it would be nice to see it in the game. Uh, if you want its maximum speed, its only maximum speed is 904 kilometers an hour. So it's not supersonic, but then again, it's an attacker, so you don't really expect it to. The next vehicle to have a look at is from Cade, and it's talking about a big old French boy. So this big old French boy, as you can see, is an absolute monstrosity when it comes to it, and uh, it's definitely... Once again, another flying boat that would be nice to see. So, uh, this uh, flying boat is known as the La Tecuer, uh 611 Ahena. I'm sure I've said that completely wrong. Uh, but this uh, started life pre-World War II. So, in 1935, the headquarters of the French fleet, they issued a technical assignment for a flying boat and the long-range marine reconnaissance vehicle, um, which, would, uh, flying weight, which would have a flying weight of around 20 tonnes. And therefore, a late 610 aircraft was designed with four Hispano Sousas, gotta love Hispano Sousas, 79.02 star engines, and they had the capacity of around 1,000 horsepower each. And in early uh, 36, they ordered a prototype of the machine. And uh, the problem was, uh, as early as December 1935, a number of changes were made to the requirements of the task, and this required a significant alteration in the structure. So therefore, the modification of the late 611 appeared uh, even before the first one was built. So the original single tail was replaced with a two-keel tail. The wingspan was increased uh, by about 2.75 meters, and the length uh, was also increased by about 2.5 five meters the total weight was also increased by 25 tons so they made this thing a lot more chunkier than before the construction of the prototype of the plant in Toulouse had already begun when they decided to install different engines. Uh, the Gnome, the Nomron uh, 14N4 or 5s which gave 1,010 horsepower each and the late 611 was a freestanding monoplane supported uh, uh, supported by underwing floats, and these uh, were retracted by electrical drive in flight. Uh, so they aren't just ones which you know stay down. You could actually bring them up, which is kind of novel of the general idea. The design was. Uh, the design was, uh, uh, I don't know how you put it. The design was supposed to be made not out of metal, is the best way to put it. You know, they wanted to use different materials, and also the defensive weapons of the project consisted of two 13.2 millimeter machine gun Hotchkisses in the front edge of the center wings. Then you'd have a 25 millimeter Hotchkiss cannon in the upper turret, four 7.5 millimeter Darn machine guns, uh, which would fire through the nest on the sides, and two of the same in the uh, harvested fodder and the late 611 it was built in Biscarossa uh, on the 2nd of March 1939 and they began testing it on the water and the first flight took place on the 8th of March and by the 1st of July when the test was suspended to make various changes to the aircraft the boat flew for about 18 hours and 15 minutes in 14 flights and the modifications were reduced to the installation of the Nomron 14N30 engines instead of the original 14N4 ones and uh, the replacement of the twin 13.2 millimeter machine guns by one 7.5 millimeter Darn machine gun and uh, by November the 15th 1939 the tests were once again resumed but not for long 
After 11 days, the plane was again reworked since the 25mm cannons were extremely unreliable, uh, only 10 rounds per magazine, which is kind of crazy, and a pair of uh, damn machine guns were mounted in its upper turret. And on the 23rd of December 1939, the fleet headquarters announced the decision to order 10 aircraft of the advanced version of the late 612, and it should have been different from the late 611 uh, because it would have been powered by Pratt & Whitney S3 CG four star engines and also the 7.5 millimeter machine guns and the upper and stern units equipped with a hydraulic drive so flight tests once again took part uh, for this for this uh, late 611 and during the test the aircraft made three flights 81 hours in total and on the 12th of april the fleet handed over the fleet aviation uh, calling it the ahina and by the end of may 1940 the late 611 flew to north africa and uh, you know uh, potted about of it all the weapons were removed though due to a truce and then it was able to fly in many other areas as well showing that it was able to you know showing that it was able to be combat effective i suppose and be a reconnaissance vehicle and just float about the place so there is two obvious um you could throw in an early version of this and a late version of this and also throw in up to seven thousand kilos worth of bombs which i think is pushing it a little bit but you know it's still possible i suppose if you wanted to so this could easily be one of those very lower tier bombers with a lot of uh, pain on them the next vehicle we'll have a look at is from Einherger, uh, 1979, and it's talking about the J-34, which is of course the Swedish Hunter. Uh, this is a vehicle that I've seen a lot of people ask for, and I understand why, because it is definitely a mainstay uh, for the Swedish, and uh, it is one which was used a lot by them, so it would be nice uh, to see it in the game. So let's generally talk about the hunters and how did, you know, the Swedish get their hands on them. So Sweden became the first uh, export customer for the hunter. It signed a contract for 120 F4 airframes in 1954, and these were designated at the F50s by Hawkers and also the J34 by the Flygniaved Pet, which is how I always say it and I always say it wrong. Uh, but that's, if you don't know what that is, is the Swedish Air Force. The F50s, they were serialed from 34 2001 to 34120 and the first made its first flights on the 24th of june 1955 they didn't buy any two-seaters just single-seater aircraft and while built to the same standards as the ref f4s the f50s initially lacked the prominent link collector tanks under the nose uh, these were retrofitted later on and while they never received the dogtooth wing extensions they were built with the mod 288 four pylon wing so the swedish hunters were amongst the first to be fitted with Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles, which is kind of cool, uh, and, or rewired outboard wing pylons, and a small number were fitted with a Volvo Flig motor afterburner system. But this was not used operationally, and with the Lansen and Draken coming online, no further modifications were attempted. So the F-50s were flown by uh, four different wings, the F-8, 9, 10, and 18, until being retired in 1966, and the F-18 actually formed an acrobatic team named the Acro Hunters in 1962. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? Looking at the general armament of this machine, very similar to other Hunters, you have four 30mm Adens or Akans as they're known uh, by the Swedish, and then two RB24Bs, which of course are AIM, uh, which are of course are AIM 9Bs. So they would be very similar to, you know, the Swedish Hunter, uh, sorry, the British Hunter uh, we have in game, uh, apart from the fact that it would have that wonderful, you know, swept wing, so it'd be more closer to the F6 than the F1, I believe we have in game, but it would be lovely to see, you know, another vehicle which could add uh, to this nice little uh, Swedish tech tree and give them some AIM-9Bs, have a bit of fun with it, in my opinion, it would be lovely. So that is all of the stuff for the aviation part of Pass the Developers for February of 2020. I hope you have enjoyed this video, and as always, I'll see you next time. I just want to thank Ambrosius McClellan, B. Young, Blackie, Chris Giltnane, Daniel Stanton, J. Wilt, John Ryman, Martinez, Super Cacti, Trigger Hippie, Eugene's Terry, and also Elove Goat and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.